This is actually shocking. And it hasn't changed that much from when I was a student at Yale University. I graduated from there in 1985. And I am still talking about this. It's shocking to me because I thought, I really believed that the gap would be closed. And of course it was going on before I started school. This is just my frame of reference. So throughout the book, I use the term emerging majority. I don't use the term minority. Why? The reason why is because it is projected that sometime between 2040 and 2050, people of color will be the majority in the United States. In fact, it's already happening. Uh, one of the individuals that I interviewed in this book, Dr. Isaiah Warner, who is a very, very prestigious professor at LSU, uh, Louisiana State University, and I really enjoyed interviewing him. But he pointed out, for example, that in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, this has already happened. This has already happened in terms of emerging majorities being the majority, so they're no longer minorities. So we want to keep that in mind because that changes the dialogue a lot. It really does. So when speaking of emerging majorities, we have some issues that we have to come to terms with. First, there is the notion of food injustice. Food injustice. And when I speak of food injustice, what I'm referring to are two specific categories. One is the food desert. This means that in low socioeconomic communities, there may not be a grocery store. Okay, so here in South Florida, we know of Publix and Dixie and, and, and Whole Foods. So oftentimes, you go to a lower socioeconomic community, there is no grocery store. There are little community stores, there are bodegas, and so forth. And if you go around the United States, you find this to be the case. So that is referred to as a food desert. A food mirage is when the stores decide to come in to the community, but the people who live there can't afford the food in the stores. So it's like a mirage for them. They want to eat healthy, they would love to eat healthy, but they can't afford to eat healthy. So who moves in to make sure that they can eat food? Fast food restaurants, okay? Liquor stores, all of the things that are not needed for health are in the communities that are of a lower socioeconomic status in this country. And who lives in the communities predominantly? People of color. So that is one of the realities that we have to come to terms with. I also wanted to talk about food in relationship to something called soul food. How many of you know soul food? <laughs> it's so delicious, right? Yeah. But let's talk about what soul food is. Because when we look at black people in the United States, and I want to be very clear, not all black people. Not all black people are at home eating soul food. But some do. And it is delicious. Uh, my mother is from Georgia, so I ate soul food throughout my life. So let me tell you a little bit about it. On page 15, during slavery, they, when I say they, I'm referring to slaves, subsisted on scraps from the master's table, second line, imperfect crops and pork, organ meat such as brains or liver, fried foods, highly salted vegetables, greens. We know some of those greens as collard greens. And unusual animal parts, generally discarded by the master, were prepared to ingenious fashions to add flavor. Cattle and beef were usually consumed by whites. Pig snoots, pig feet, brains, Chitlins, in the book I wrote chitterlings, but it's chitlins, right? <laughs> so chitlins and tripe became the cuisine of the African American culture. So let's understand this. This is the garbage that the masters would throw away. 
and the slaves would get the refuse food. And then they would add a lot of spice, fry it, cook those tough vegetables until all the nutrients were gone to try to make them soft. And they made it delicious. But then that got passed on from generation to generation to generation. This is not cultural. And so when we look at the soul food, we say, well, you know, black people eat it. This is part of the culture. This was an imposition that became culture. And there's a difference. And how did I come to realize this? I travel extensively around this world, and we had the experience of going to West Africa. And I was eating the food in West Africa. And you know how that light bulb goes on, and you have that epiphany? And I realized that they are not eating what we are eating at home at all over here in West Africa. And these are the people who came over to our country. We're descendants of the people here. So why are we eating that? And they're eating this. What's going on? And then I realized what soul food is. And so it's not genetics. It's that people are eating food that's not healthy. Now, you can't really tell black people today, some black people, to stop eating soul food. Because the question that would be asked of me is, have you lost your mind? <laughs> we will be eating soul food, correct? And this is in my own family. I speak of my own family. This is not something I can change. My mother was from Georgia. She was such a fantastic cook, just wonderful. And this is not a woman that I could tell to stop preparing soul food. In fact, I didn't know how to make it. But what I wanted was modification. We can modify it. So I wrote a book. My mother is deceased. But I wrote a book of all her recipes. It's called Effie's Soul Food Recipes with a Healthy Twist. You can find it on Amazon.com. <laughs> OK, so my mother's recipes are there, but I modified them. Um, because I knew it had to be done because we're going to want to continue to eat these foods and this is what needs to happen. The next thing that I want to bring to your attention is the school to prison pipeline. How many of you know what that is? The school to prison pipeline. Okay, so let's venture into that a little bit. There are some key facts to begin with in the discussion of the school to prison pipeline. This is page 31. First, Black boys are three times more likely to be suspended than are white boys. And black girls are six times more likely to be suspended than are white girls. This disparity in disciplinary rates represents a critical problem in the initial piece in the school to prison pipeline. To make matters worse, schools have implemented no tolerance policies which contribute to the trend of incarcerating school children for minor infractions that would normally be handled by in-school disciplinary actions. Children in the K through 12 system are being arrested. Another piece in the school to prison pipeline. So there is a solution to this. It's so common sense, it's so simple. And the solution began right here in Broward County. Broward County, Florida School Superintendent Robert Gruncy who decided that in his school district there would be appropriate responses and use of resources when responding to school-based misbehavior. The Broward County School Board voted unanimously to sign new rules meant to drive down arrest rates of school-aged children. This common sense approach results in in-school disciplinary actions rather than arrests with the understanding that K through 12 children must not be arrested for matters that could be handled at school. I can't even believe that I had to write this down, that we have gotten to that point where we have to say, don't arrest the little children at school. But this is what has happened, so why? We have to ask ourselves, why is this happening in our country that little children in the K through 12 system are being arrested? And there's a reason for it. The reason is called prison profiteering. Mm -hmm. Private prisons in the United States, they get a very nice, handy workforce 
by arresting individuals in the United States, including young people. The question that comes to mind is why would there be a school to prison pipeline in the first place? What kind of society would imprison its children rather than trying to redirect them with positive reinforcement? What kind of society would allocate more resources toward prisons than toward their educational system? The answers are complicated. They are businesses traded on the New York Stock Exchange, the prison to achieve the often 90 to 100% occupancy rates required per contracts, they rely on the following. Mandatory minimum sentences, felony plea bargains, a lot of the people are not guilty that are in these prisons because they plead for um, their scenarios to continue without a long-term sentence. The three strikes law, immigration detainment, and lastly, arrests of young people in schools. 